Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Anne McKenna. I'm the program coordinator for the Africa Oxford Initiative and the senior reader at the Canterbury Institute. On behalf of the Canterbury Institute, I want to warmly welcome you all for our first annual body lecture. The Canterbury Institute um, is a community of students and scholars at the University of Oxford striving to live the academic vocation in a spirit of humility towards the truth. Along with organizing events such as this one, the Canterbury Institute also hosts the Barry Scholarship for graduate students. This is all made possible by the generous contribution of the John and Dario Barry Foundation. You can find out more about the scholarship as well as the Institute from the website. It is now my great pleasure to welcome our speaker for the first annual Barry Lecture, Professor Tyler Vanderwill. Professor Van der Will is a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He is a director of the Human Flourishing Program, as well as a co-director for the Initiative on Health, Religion and Spirituality at the Harvard University. His research focuses on the application of causal inferences to epidemiology, as well as the relationship between religion and health. Professor Vanderwill is an accomplished academic with over 300 publications in peer-reviewed journals and is also the author of the book Explanations in Causal Inferences. His work and outstanding contributions to the profession of statistics has been recognized with the prestigious President's Award by the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies in 2017. He is currently the Eastman Visiting Professor at the University of Oxford and a senior reader at the Canterbury Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Vanderbilt. It is a pleasure to be able to speak to you all today. I would like to thank Dominic Burbage and everyone at the Canterbury Institute for the invitation to give this lecture. I would also like to thank John and Daria Berry for their support of the Institute and its fellows. I will be speaking today on the promotion of human flourishing and, and presenting a framework to attempt to interpret uh, various aspects of well-being for individuals uh, and more globally. Um, I'll begin with a brief description as to what the notion of flourishing means and some of our recent attempts to measure uh, different aspects of flourishing. Um, and then we'll focus uh, during the second half of this lecture on how this notion of flourishing might be viewed as an interpretive framework um, to understand different determinants of well-being, to assess the contributions of various disciplines using medicine and positive psychology as a case study, and to evaluate narratives of societal progress. I will conclude with some uh, recommendations, the way forward with regard to research and the promotion of well-being, and we'll also discuss some of the limitations of the framework that I will be presenting. Uh, some of this material, especially that in the first half of the lecture, can also be found in a paper on the promotion of human flourishing published a couple of years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the Human Flourishing Program's work at Harvard a university is focused on many of the aspects of study that I will be presenting today. So if we look across our various academic disciplines, we see many of them aspire to rather grand visions of flourishing. Uh, the World Health Organization defines health, a definition going back to 1948 and still in place today, as a state of complete physical mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, the discipline of economics is sometimes conceived of as an attempt to study the, the maximization of expected utility, taking into account all aspects of an agent's preferences. Now, the discipline of positive psychology is sometimes defined as the scientific study of the strengths that enable individuals and communities to thrive. So we see these grand visions of human flourishing that these disciplines are allegedly attempting to study. Um, but in practice, if we look at actual individual studies, we see that they are often restricted to very specific um, health outcomes or disease states, um, uh, very specific economic outcomes or simple measures of positive affect. 
they don't quite capture flourishing in its full sense. Um, if we turn to what flourishing might in fact mean, what it might, what might be constituted by it, if we turn to our dictionaries, the Oxford English Dictionary defines flourishing as to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way, and the American Heritage Dictionary to do or fare well. Uh, the etymology of the term comes from Latin florare, to bloom, blossom, or flower. It's often used as a translation of Aristotle's eudaimonia, and sometimes also translated as happiness. Uh, the definition we've been working with uh, at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard is that flourishing or a state of complete human well-being is a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. Very broad, very expansive, but this is arguably what we are after as, as individuals and, and should be after as a society. In terms of attempts to try to measure or, or assess uh, flourishing or well-being empirically, probably the discipline that has come closest to attempting to do so is, is that of um, positive psychology. Um, and numerous measures have been put forward, um, but notably absent from many of these measures of psychological well-being are, are any notion whatsoever of um, physical health. And yet, are we fully flourishing um, if, if we're not healthy, if we're, if we're bedridden, for, for example? Um, it seems like health really ought to be part of a reasonable conception of flourishing. Um, also absent from um, many of these measures of well-being um, is, is any notion of virtue or character. Uh, essentially contrary to um, the understanding of well-being or flourishing in, in Plato and Aristotle and most of the Western uh, philosophical and theological tradition and in most um, philosophical and religious traditions worldwide. I mean, these seem like uh, important absences from uh, much of the work that's being done um, in psychology. Um, but, but with a notion so broad as flourishing, is it really ever possible uh, to measure such a thing? Um, and, and moreover, is it possible to achieve any sort of consensus uh, conceptions of what flourishing uh, will include are likely to, to differ across persons, across cultures, across different philosophical, religious, and theological traditions. So can we really come to any sort of consensus on these questions? What I would argue is that although conceptions of flourishing are likely to differ across um, cultural, religious, and philosophical uh, traditions, I think any well-developed, uh, reasonable conception of flourishing is likely to include the following five domains of human life as well. It's not that flourishing is reducible to, to these five, um, but that whatever else it might include, these five would be included as well. And they are happiness and life satisfaction, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. Again, the argument is not that these things exhaust what flourishing consists of, but, but they're arguably a part of it. Again, that any reasonable conception of flourishing would include these five as well. I think each of these five domains also satisfies the, the, the following two criteria. Each is nearly uh, universally desired, um, and I'll come back to some empirical data to support this a little bit later. Um, and also each of these constitutes its own end. Each uh, of these domains is sought for its own sake and not merely as a means to something else. And, and I do think these two criteria, being nearly universally desired um, and being an end in and of itself, uh, might be useful in trying to shape consensus around what to measure. So for a, a short and you know, admittedly crude uh, scale to, to try to begin to assess uh, empirically flourishing in, in different contexts. Um, we've proposed a, a brief um, flourishing index uh, that consists of two questions in each of these domains, uh, chosen principally from um, the questions and, and survey items um, that are already widely in use in well-being research and that have received um, some degree of empirical validation. Um, so drawing mostly upon um, existing work, um, but, but trying to have adequate 
conceptual coverage across these domains. Uh, the only two questions in the measure I will be presenting that are um, new are those with regard to character and virtue. And although um, the empirical work on the measurement of character has increased in, in, in dramatic and in some remarkable ways over the last 15 years, in, in part due to the, the work on character strengths by, by Peterson and Seligman, um, most of the, those measures uh, require perhaps 20 questions to assess you know, a, a particular uh, character strength, uh, such as courage, for example. Um, and there are very few uh, single item questions or, or, or measures that um, are attempting to get at character more globally. Um, so this was the one domain where, um, in collaboration with, with philosophers, we did propose two new questions. One, uh, to very crudely try to get at notions of um, practical wisdom and, and, and justice, and the second one trying to get at fortitude and, and moderation. And those four um, virtues are sometimes called the, the, the cardinal virtues thought in um, much of the Western philosophical tradition to lie at the foundation um, of all moral virtue. Um, so as to the questions um, themselves with regard to the first domain, happiness and life satisfaction, uh, the first question was how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? Uh, scored from zero to ten, zero not at all satisfied, ten completely satisfied. Um, and this is perhaps the most frequently used well-being question in uh, the, the, the research and in, in policy literature. It's um, used in the UK's uh, annual survey, it's used by the OECD, um, it's been used by the Gallup poll and, and, and by many others. Um, so it's essentially a cognitive evaluation of one's life as a whole and how satisfied one is with it. Uh, the second question in that happiness and life satisfaction domain is one more about positive affect and one's feelings in general, how happy or unhappy do you usually feel? Um, again, scored zero to 10. Uh, the second domain relates to physical and mental health um, with the physical health question in general, how would you rate your physical health? Um, for mental health, how would you rate your overall mental health? And again, these questions are likewise used in, in numerous surveys, the US General Survey and um, by the World Health Organization, for example. Uh, the third domain is meaning and purpose. Uh, and one question on uh, one's, uh, one's activities overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are, are worthwhile? And this question likewise has been used extensively in uh, well-being research, including the UK's annual survey and, and by the OECD and, and many other studies as well. Uh, but then also something more, um, more cognitive as the second question in this domain. Uh, I understand my purpose in life scored um, zero completely disagree to um, 10 completely agree. Uh, the fourth domain was character and, and virtue. And here again, two items or, or questions are, are assessed. Uh, first, I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging uh, situations. Zero, um, not at all true of me. Uh, ten, completely true of me. Um, uh, and, and, and this item is essentially trying to crudely capture um, some notion of prudence or practical wisdom and justice. And then a second item trying to crudely capture notions of um, fortitude um, or, or, or temperance and moderation. Um, I'm always able to give up some happiness now for a greater happiness later. Um, and then the final domain, the fifth domain, on um, close social relationships. Uh, these two items were both taken uh, from the uh, review of the UK's uh, campaign to end loneliness as assessment of different survey items. Um, so these two were recommended uh, for relatively short assessments. Uh, the first one, I'm content with my friendships and relationships, essentially trying to capture the, um, the extent or quantity of those relationships. And then um, second, my relationships are as satisfying as I would like them to be, essentially trying to capture the quality of, of those relationships. Um, and, and so the scores uh, of the two items in each domain can be combined, averaged um, to, to give an overall score for each of those five domains, but essentially just an individual self-assessment of how well life is going in each of those domains. 
Uh, all of them could be averaged uh, t t together for an overall index from, from 0 to 10, but really this is nothing more than a you know, composite of those five more, more meaningful individual domain uh, assessments. Uh, we've typically supplemented those questions with um, two others in, in some of the empirical work I'll be describing a little bit later in this lecture, um, but two, two additional questions on, on financial and uh, material stability, because for flourishing to be sustained o over time, one's financial and material r resources should be um, such that these, these various domains of, of well-being um, can be supported. So the uh, two additional questions drawn principally from uh, the, the literature on um, financial well-being are first, how often do you worry about being able to meet normal monthly uh, living expenses? Um, zero always worry, ten never worry, and then uh, how often do you worry about safety, food, or housing? Again, scored zero uh, to ten. Um, and so the, the, the sort of 12 questions as a whole could likewise be, be averaged for more of a, a secure measure of um, flourishing, which is, which is perhaps less satisfactory um, conceptually because financial resources really are, are means uh, rather than ends, uh, but, but maybe more satisfactory in practice insofar as uh, perhaps a better indication of the capacity to sustain flourishing over time. Uh, as a, a simple example of, of the use of, of some of these measures to give you a, you know, a sense as to how the numbers uh, might play out in one specific context, so I'll talk about many others as we uh, go through the remainder of this lecture. Um, I'll, I'll be presenting here some um, data on about 4,000 residents of, of North Carolina in the United States who are members of the Legacy Credit Union, uh, about 46 years old on, on average, 73% uh, white, 17% black, 10% other, 57% married, 18% divorced, 18% never married. Um, but we see here um, the, the various questions that had just reviewed um, their mean across the sample and, and also their, their standard uh, deviation, how much spread is there around the mean. Um, so we see in, in this particular sample, and, and many of these patterns are, are similar in other samples, so I will come to some exceptions later on, but in this particular sample, um, there's greater satisfaction with life than there is a sense of feeling happy. Um, uh, f physical health in this sample was rated lower than um, mental health, and, and this kind of does vary across uh, the samples we've examined. Um, this uh, particular sample has a larger proportion of older individuals, which, which may explain the, the lower physical health score. Um, Worthwhile activities was rated uh, considerably higher than understanding one's purpose in life, and that worthwhile activities question was in fact the highest score across all of the um, different questions in, in the sample. Um, there was a stronger sense of being able to always seek to do what is good and, and right than, than there was um, being able to delay gratification, give up some happiness now for a greater happiness later. Uh, this group was more content with their uh, relationships and the extent of those than they were satisfied with them. Um, and uh, financial and material stability were, were among the lowest uh, rated questions. And um, uh, we've, we've seen these patterns, uh, not in all, but in, in many of the, uh, of the samples as well. So this just gives some sense as to how these numbers might um, play out in practice. Um, I won't bore you with all of the um, statistical uh, complexities and, and technicalities, but we, we have um, collected data on a number of different samples in the, in the United States and um, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Mexico, China, and many other countries now as, as well. Um, but the, the psychometric properties um, generally are considered fairly, fairly satisfactory for perhaps the more um, statistically, technically uh, in inclined, uh, convex alpha here uh, for the um, first five domains is 0.89, and for the uh, when we include the financial questions as well, uh, 0.86. Uh, so these are, are generally considered uh, fairly good levels of consistency across the, um, the questions. Um, the, the measure is undoubtedly subject to um, a, a number of important limitations. I mean, first, we only have two questions per, per domain. I mean, this is important so that this sort of work and survey and, and measurement can take place in a wide variety of settings. The longer 
uh, the assessment, the more difficult and expensive it is to ad administer, or to convince others to, to include it in their work. So there are, are trade-offs here, but the fact that there are only two questions per domain is uh, certainly a limitation. Um, it, it's also the case that certain aspects of well-being or, or flourishing are, are difficult to measure, something like purpose or, 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 or virtue are incredibly complex um, constructs, and there is a great deal of um, philosophical and theological literature has been devoted to understanding these things. So um, you know, the, the notion that uh, it could be reduced to simple questions is, is of course, um, a, a bit absurd. And, and trying to measure these things at, at all um, is, is, is challenging. And, and um, I will come back to some of those limitations um, later on, uh, but do want to acknowledge them. Um, there's also, uh, you know, these, these assessments are subject to potential self-report biases, the, you know, the possibility that um, individuals may want to give socially desirable responses. Um, and for something like you know, character, this might be thought to be particularly problematic. Though interestingly, there, there is some empirical research suggesting that um, the uh, even self-report uh, assessments of character correlate reasonably well uh, with other uh, assessment of, of that individual's character as well. Um, so while these are unquestionably imperfect, I do think we are learning um, something from this data. For most people, someone rating themselves uh, a nine rather than a seven does, does convey some information. Um, both might be overestimates of, of, of the truth, but that, that variation still um, gives us information about the person's life. Um, and then finally, certainly these, these five or, or six domains don't cover all aspects of, um, of flourishing. Again, any reasonably well-developed uh, conception of flourishing would be much richer than these um, five domains or these um, ten questions. And I'll, I'll again be coming back to that as a limitation later on as well. Um, nevertheless, in spite of these limitations, I think um, some attempt at um, measuring is, is better than, than nothing at all. And um, as, as, as you'll see, I think that these measurements um, do help us to gain knowledge as to the factors that um, help bring about well-being. Um, and I think uh, these attempts at measurement um, also are useful for um, shifting discussion and, and priorities beyond just um, economic and health outcomes uh, to some of these other uh, dimensions and, 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 and domains like meaning and purpose or, or character. Um, moreover, I think the proposed domains may help us to achieve um, some consensus around what to measure. Again, each I think is nearly universally desired and each constitutes its own end. Um, and, and so I think, you know, can be useful as well for um, research in different cultures. I think maybe the exact questions one would want to ask um, in, in different cultures may, may, may vary across countries, but I think the domains are uh, are fairly universal. Um, we've begun some work on uh, trying to defend this notion that these, these various domains are uh, nearly universally desired. And so in a number of different contexts now, uh, not only have we asked individuals to assess themselves on each of these domains, but we've asked how important are um, each of these domains uh, to you and individuals rate the importance of each of these domains, again, on a scale from zero to 10, zero not at all important, 10 um, extremely important. Um, this data here comes from a sample of about 2,000 employees um, at the uh, health insurance company, uh, insurance company Aetna. Um, and uh, in, although there's some variation across these domains in, in um, virtually every case, um, the, the average importance score um, across individuals is about nine out, out of 10. So very close to, to extremely important. Uh, we see very few individuals scoring any of these domains um, below um, uh, a five. Um, so there, there is um, you know, some variation across the, the domains. Um, uh, in this particular uh, sample, physical health is rated a little bit higher than emotional health a little bit higher than financial security, than purpose, than character, than a social connection. And, and this particular sample was uh, rated as, as the least important, though still, still very important on the whole. Um, interestingly, in the, again, in this sample, um, women and, and men gave, gave the exact same ranking of, of the 
um, dimension, so women rated every dimension as, as being somewhat more important than, um, than men um, did, but the, the, the overall conclusion from this data is really almost pretty much all of these domains are, are scored uh, exceptionally high. People consider each of these important and we have um, similar data on importance rankings with similar conclusions from, from Poland and also other data from employees at Owens Corning and we're continuing to ask uh, uh, these questions as, as, as well. But I think we do have empirical support for this notion that um, uh, these domains really are nearly universally desired. Um, so we've continued to um, collect data in, in different settings. Um, we have data on employees at Aetna, at Kohler, at Owens Corning. We have um, data on these flourishing assessments uh, amongst factory workers in uh, Mexico, Poland, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and in China, and that list continues to expand. Um, we have uh, flourishing information now on a group of um, international flight attendants. Um, and uh, we also have data currently available or, or being collected um, in collaboration with uh, Johns Hopkins Psychiatry Department, and UCLA Surgery Department, uh, medical students at the Medical College of Georgia and Stony Brook Medical School, um, data on primary and secondary school students with a slightly revised set of questions um, in the United States, the UK, India, and, and China, um, a, a representative community sample of, of residents of, of Columbus, Ohio, um, and we're hoping next year um, in collaboration with Gallup and with the Templeton uh, philanthropies to launch a global flourishing uh, study of, of 300,000 individuals and 22 uh, geographically and um, culturally diverse countries, uh, nationally representative with e in each country with, with sort of five years of annual data collection of, on the same group of, of individuals to both assess um, flourishing in these, these different countries, um, but also to study uh, their determinants uh, over time. So this proposal is currently being considered by, for funding by the Templeton Philanthropies, but we're hoping to be able to launch this in, um, mid-2021 to, to, to understand well-being and um, also to understand its determinants. Um, some of the patterns we've seen in um, you know, these different data sets, though one does need to be careful with cross-cultural comparisons and are these questions really being interpreted um, the same way, but um, some of the patterns we have seen is often that financial dimension is uh, uh, ranked the the lowest with regard to how people feel they're doing. That's not universally the case. It was not uh, the case, for example, amongst the, the Aetna employees, but it often is the case. Um, we've, uh, many of our samples are, are within the United States, and we've seen that um, most other countries uh, tend to do better on um, social connection than, than does uh, the United States. So I, mean, I think one of the purposes of these sorts of assessments is to um, be able to evaluate what is going well uh, with regard to an individual's life and, a, and the society's life and, and what is not, what, what might need um, more work. Um, what we've also been consistently seeing is that um, most of these dimensions, um, the scores tend to increase uh, with age. And um, it had been the case some years ago that uh, many studies of well-being found a U-shaped relationship between well-being and, and age with um, those uh, in, say, their 20s and, and 30s doing reasonably well, and, and those uh, later in life doing reasonably well, and those in their 40s and 50s are often not doing um, as well. Um, over the last several years, uh, that U-shaped curve has um, tended to, the left side of it has tended to, to flatten. Um, so that many dimensions of well-being seem to, in, in fact, just steadily increase with age, um, which is, of course, a bit um, disconcerting with regard to the well-being of, of um, young people. And I, I think likewise indicates uh, a need for further work and research to understand why this is so and what might be done uh, to, to support um, their well-being. So that gives an overview of the framework we've been using to try to think about well-being, to measure well-being, and to, to study its determinants. In the second half of this lecture, um, I would like to consider different ways in which these flourishing domains uh, might be useful as an interpretative framework um, to study the well-being of um, individuals, but also the, the contribution of
um, different disciplines as well. Um, we've, we've certainly found that um, it can be very helpful for, for self-assessment. Um, you know, you're, you're welcome to, to put this on pause and go through those 10 or 12 questions uh, now yourself and, and reflect upon um, your, your own life. But the feedback that we've received when um, we've, we've carried this out in um, both educational and in workplace um, settings is that people are very grateful for the opportunity for, um, for self-reflection. Um, it's often led to identifying areas where um, uh, improvement might be desired, um, has prompted changes um, in life. It, it can also be useful for sort of tracking um, one's life and, and well-being uh, over time. So I, I think it, it's a useful interpretive framework for, for one's own life. Um, but I, I think it's also a helpful um, framework for um, trying to assess um, policies, to assess disciplines, to assess um, progress with regard to society. And so I'll be um, walking through uh, very briefly uh, a number of um, specific case studies. First, um, how, how we might think about the determinants of well-being more, more generally. Um, second, what is and is not being captured adequately in um, the disciplines of medicine and, and positive psychology. Um, and then lastly, use these flourishing domains uh, to assess um, certain narratives with regard to uh, societal progress. So we'll walk um, through each of these one by one. Um, my own discipline is, is public health, and um, often when we think of the public health relevance of a particular exposure or phenomena or, or intervention, um, we think about this as a function of two things. First, the, the prevalence of, of the exposure or phenomena, in other words, how common is it? Um, and secondly, how large are its effect sizes on the um, outcomes that, that we care about? Something that's very common and also has large effects is typically thought to have um, substantial public health importance. It shapes population health. Um, so if we look at physical health, which is often um, the principal outcome and focus of um, public health thinking, we, we're led to things like exercise, nutrition, not smoking, adequate sleep. Um, but if we expand our outcomes and our way of thinking to all these flourishing domains, um, rather than just physical health, the, the, the picture as to what really shapes flourishing or, or, or well-being in, in, in a broad sense, in fact, looks rather different. Um, so we could likewise take a step back and ask, what are things that are both common and have large effects on all, all five of these flourishing domains? On, uh, not just physical health, but also happiness and life satisfaction, and, and mental health as well, and meaning and purpose, and character and virtue, and, and close social relationships. And um, based on a, a literature review I carried out, uh, published again in that 2017 paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I would, I would pro propose four um, pathways that powerfully shape flourishing. Um, and these are family, work, education, um, and religious community. I think um, each of these things is, is relatively common in, in many populations across the world. Um, and each has, um, as a result of this literature review, considerable evidence that it powerfully shapes these different uh, flourishing domains. Um, the argument's not that these are, are exhausted. Other, other pathways uh, might uh, well be important for uh, bringing about flourishing, you know, especially at the, at the individual level, um, you know, artistic, aesthetic. Uh, pers pursuits might uh, well contribute to these flourishing domains for some individuals, but the substantial pursuit of that is, is perhaps less common. But, but the, there's no claim that these four are exhaustive, um, nor uh, would I claim that these four are, are necessary. One can flourish even in the absence of one or more of um, these, these pathways. Um, but I, I would argue that each of these things really does uh, powerfully affect the different domains of flourishing and, and is relatively common in populations across the globe. And so if, if you know, policy efforts were made to contribute to these different pathways of family work, education, and religious community, uh, the well-being of, of society as a whole um, would increase. Um, in, in that literature review, for, for those who are um, you know, more uh, empirically oriented, um, there was a restriction that was made to uh, longitudinal studies, experimental or quasi-experimental uh, designs, so cross-sectional studies where all the data was collected at a uh, single point in time were, was excluded from this review. And, and that's because these are, are generally not, these cross-sectional studies are not very useful for assessing evidence for um, causality 
Um, as one classic example, um, we know from cross-sectional data that uh, marriage is associated with greater levels of happiness. But when all the data collected at the same time, we don't know if that's because a marriage actually brings about greater levels of happiness, or is that because happy people are more likely to go on to get married? Um, and with, with cross-sectional data, we just can't tell. Um, in fact, from rigorous uh, longitudinal studies, there, there is evidence uh, for both, but, but again, with cross-sectional data, we just wouldn't know. Um, likewise, religious service attendance is associated with lower depression rates. Um, but is that because uh, religious services protect against depression, or is that because people who become depressed withdraw from religious services and really from all sorts of forms of social engagement? Uh, again, we can't tell with cross-sectional data, even though from longitudinal studies we now know that there is evidence for, um, for, for both. So we, we really do need these longitudinal studies to be able to try to sort out evidence for uh, causation. Um, so we, we conducted this um, uh, literature review trying to control for um, outcomes at baseline to rule out reverse causation, trying to assess um, potential robustness to, to confounding, um, whenever possible trying to draw on meta-analyses of these longitudinal studies that combine evidence across uh, studies, but um, in some of these cases uh, the literature review required throwing out the vast majority of, of studies which are uh, cross-sectional. Uh, so, for example, looking at a religious community and happiness and life satisfaction, although there are over 100 studies uh, on this, at the time of, of this review, uh, only one really met the, the criteria for um, uh, you know, ad adequate rigor to contribute evidence. Um, so this next figure uh, shows these, these four domains I've proposed, uh, family, work, education, and religious community. Um, and these five um, domains of, of flourishing. And um, the, the, the numbers here are uh, various studies, uh, references in that paper, um, that provide this, this sort of rigorous evidence. Um, the evidence is stronger in some of these cases than, than others, and there's certainly more work to be done. Uh, to strengthen this uh, evidence, but at least some evidence uh, from rigorous studies that each of these pathways contributes to uh, the various flourishing domains. Um, and uh, you know, I think policies that are put in place to promote family or work or education or religious community uh, would likely promote flourishing. Often um, you know, policies are evaluated principally through an economic lens, but I think if we were to broaden the outcomes that we consider, um, it may lead to different sorts of policies put in place. Uh, so for example, with work, um, I really think that welfare policy should be such as to not disincentivize work, um, because although the provision of material resources or, or, or health care um, may adequately provide for um, material needs, the effects of work on well-being are much broader. It also provides meaning and purpose. It, it shapes relationships. Um, it, it provides opportunities to grow as a person, to grow in character. Um, and so when work is disincentivized by um, welfare policies, while material needs are, are met, the, the other aspects of flourishing are, are not. So, so welfare policies should be structured so as to um, promote engagement and, and work. And there's been you know, impressive research done um, indicating that um, even for um, those with severe mental illness, supportive employment programs can, can provide um, uh, sustained work uh, over time. And these have been evaluated in, in randomized trials. So I think we need to, to think creatively with regard to not just how to provide um, the material resources necessary, but, but to promote work itself. Um, you know, likewise, with regard to um, marriage in the United States, at least in a number of states, um, the welfare system is, is such that um, one, is, one is penalized uh, by, by marrying rather than just staying as an unmarried uh, couple. One loses some of the welfare benefits. And this is problematic. Um, you know, while maybe there's only a marginal economic difference, if this is preventing marriage and, and there's evidence that, that, that it is, these marriage penalties are, um, this will be impeding various other aspects um, of, of, of flourishing, of well-being, including um, the depth and closeness of, of relationships, a sense of meaning, and, and um, evidence also that it affects the flourishing of, of the children as, as well. So I, I think these sorts of marriage penalties should be uh, 
uh, removed. Uh, within the realm of education, um, in the United States at least, there's a great deal of um, you know, debate over um, uh, school choice, public versus private versus religious versus homeschooling. Uh, much of that work, and I think the research is very important, has focused on academic outcomes. Um, but one, one could also look at how these different forms of school participation uh, contribute to other broader flourishing outcomes like meaning and purpose or character or, or relationships and some of our current research at the Human Flourishing uh, Program is, is doing uh, just that and, and I think that research would be supportive of a parental choice with regard to uh, the type of school and education so as to pursue a diversity of ends, not, not just um, academic achievement, though that is of course important and central. Um, you know, with regard to uh, religious communities, the fact that there's now evidence that these uh, promote greater health and longevity, uh, lower depression, greater civic engagement and, and volunteering, greater meaning and numerous other outcomes, um, I, I think implies that it really is important to retain uh, the tax exempt status of these institutions so they can carry out their, their good work. Um, you know, likewise, I think it's important that um, uh, many of the negative uh, media portrayals and, and portrayals in the academic world with regard to um, the problems of religious communities, which are real and, and need to be addressed. Um, but I think those portrayals need to be balanced by the positive contributions uh, these religious communities as, uh, make as, as, as well. And, uh, my own view would be that a lot of the negative uh, media attention um, has led to declining religious uh, participation uh, rates. And, and I think that has adversely affected um, the flourishing of our, of our uh, society. So problems need to be addressed, but they need to be um, balanced by what these communities do to contribute to well-being. Um, so these are just some of the ways I think this flourishing lens in these different domains can be used to, to help understand policy decisions. Um, I'd like to very briefly now touch upon um, how this framework of these flourishing domains uh, might be used to understand the respective contributions of, of different disciplines um, and what might be missed uh, by some of these disciplines at, at present. And so I'll uh, focus uh, briefly on medicine and then on um, positive psychology. Um, so I, you know, I certainly don't think these questions should always be asked in, in every setting. I'm, I'm, uh, not convinced, for example, that in an annual physical exam it's necessary to go through the 12 uh, flourishing questions. You know, maybe in some context it, it, it could be helpful, but I, you know, I certainly wouldn't advocate for um, uh, universal use um, of, of these always. But I think there are a number of contexts within medicine um, where it would be useful to do an assessment of flourishing uh, more broadly. Um, one concerns uh, Clinician burnout, the fact that um, more and more uh, physicians and, and, and nurses feel they, they simply can't um, go on. Many regret entering uh, medicine. Um, likewise, uh, for many, the medical school experience and perhaps especially the residency experience is, is extremely uh, stressful in a time of very low well-being. And, and so I think these flourishing assessments can perhaps help us um, diagnose these issues, uh, to focus on the domains of flourishing that are um, in greatest um, need and to understand the efforts and policies that might be put, made and put in place to, um, to support well-being of, of clinicians, to, to try to counter this phenomena of clinician burnout. Um, and some recent data published by uh, some of our partners at Johns Hopkins uh, University um, of those uh, six domains that the health domain was scored uh, lowest of the six amongst clinicians. And, and this, is, this is concerning, this is worrying. The clinicians are supposed to be um, providing um, uh, health-related resources to the um, general population, and yet they themselves are um, suffering most, it appears, from, from this data with regard to their uh, mental and physical health. Um, so again, I think flourishing considerations come into play here. Um, likewise, I think these flourishing assessments might be useful in evaluating um, long-term uh, patient care. Um, sometimes such care is assessed based on um, patient satisfaction surveys, which I, th I do think have, have some value, but sometimes can indicate simply whether the patient was given what they wanted rather than what truly supports their 
long-term um, well-being, and this may be especially relevant at, at present during the, the opioid uh, crisis where um, satisfaction might be high if the opioids are prescribed, but it can um, uh, substantially diminish uh, well-being long-term. Um, so I think medium to long-term flourishing assessments might be a helpful way to supplement the uh, shorter-term patient satisfaction surveys. Um, likewise, I think in some major treatment decisions, really these flourishing domains should come into play because they, they can come into conflict. Um, and uh, you know, a few cases I've laid out here, uh, also in paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association are, are as follows. And consider a man with, with bladder cancer, the, the removal of his bladder would maximize life expectancy, but could um, severely hamper quality of life and happiness. So how, how do we weigh um, these things and what might be most important in deciding about treatment. Um, or psych scientists might have um, psychotic symptoms and uh, medications might help suppress these but impede his capacity to, to work. So how, how do we balance these different um, domains of well-being? Uh, likewise, a woman with a positive test for a genetic variant that strongly predisposes towards uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer uh, may be in difficult situation with regard to deciding uh, whether or not to, to have her ovaries removed, which um, no research has shown would um, substantially reduce breast cancer and ovarian cancer risk uh, for, this, for this very high risk group, um, but could potentially then, or would in fact, make her infertile, you know, potentially compromising her social well-being, um, purpose, happiness, depending on whether she wanted to have children or not. Um, finally, uh, consider a, a celebrity chef with tongue cancer. The, the removal of tongue would um, maximize survival, but uh, it would severely affect social relationships and effectively end um, his work and, and, and career. Um, so in, in each of these cases, um, physical health, or at least maximizing um, life expectancy or years of disease-free survival, uh, comes into conflict with some other a domain of flourishing. And in these cases, I think it's important to consider uh, what a patient considers most important uh, to them in deciding on the appropriate course of action. And likewise, I think in randomized trials intended to assess different treatment options, we should be measuring not only um, years or months of disease-free survival, but also effects on these different flourishing domains. So individuals can make uh, well-reasoned uh, decisions. And we've been partnering with um, clinical researchers at different institutions to try to carry this sort of work out. So I think flourishing is relevant in thinking about medicine, um, and I think this flourishing framework um, is also helpful to see what some of the contributions of positive psychology have and have not been able to achieve. Um, and positive psychology is, as I said at the beginning, arguably the discipline that's going to come closest to um, you know, trying to measure and, and assess uh, well-being relatively holistically, um, uh, but doesn't always engage with all of the, the domains uh, equally and, and has perhaps focused uh, too much on, on measures of, of um, happiness and, and life satisfaction and, and to a certain extent also mental health. Um, and so the, the discipline has come under some uh, you know, critique for over, trying to oversimplify um, these things, uh, but, but I think has made um, incredible contributions in terms of, kind of raising awareness of, of some of these other well-being outcomes and also providing you know, relatively simple, easy to use, do-it-yourself interventions that can um, improve uh, well-being. Again, sometimes these are, are criticized for being overly simplistic, but I think some of these really draw on um, deep insights from um, philosophical and, and, and religious traditions worldwide and, and um, essentially try to you know, disseminate these ideas and make these practices more common. Um, and so many of these practices and these do-it-yourself interventions have been evaluated in, in rigorous randomized trials. Um, one common one are, are gratitude exercises where maybe three times a week you write down uh, three things you're grateful for and why and uh, maybe you would you know, share them with a spouse or a family member or a, a friend. And in randomized trials, that practice has been shown to have effects on happiness, on self-reported health, on depressive symptoms, on sleep. Um, another sort of do-it-yourself intervention is uh, kind of to promote acts of kindness. Once a week, uh, for six weeks, 
uh, choose a day and on that day uh, attempt to carry out five acts of kindness towards others that you would not ordinarily uh, otherwise uh, do. And um, this also has been found in uh, randomized trials to improve uh, various outcomes, including happiness, one sense of engagement, lowering of depressive symptoms, increasing sense of, uh, of, of connectedness. Um, I've tried this myself. It can be challenging to find you know, a, a day where you can do five uh, additional acts, but I think it, it actually does have um, a powerful effect on, on individuals, as indicated uh, by the randomized trials. But but simply also in orienting um, oneself and one's life to seeking good for, for others. Uh, yet another um, uh, positive psychology uh, exercise that has been studied in randomized trials is trying to imagine one's best possible uh, self go out 20 years and imagine kind of achieving all that you had hoped for with regard to your relationships and your, um, uh, your, your, your work and your leisure activities and so on and so forth. Um, and then you know, think about how to, to, to bring that best possible self about. Um, and again, in randomized trials, this has been shown to have effects on increasing happiness, increasing one's sense of optimism, increasing one's sense of uh, flow. Um, in a paper published just earlier this year in the Journal of Positive Psychology and, and Wellbeing, I've reviewed a number of um, other of these uh, sorts of, of examples and also discussed some of their um, uh, limitations. Um, but I, I do think if these sorts of activities uh, were uh, disseminated broadly, it really would increase uh, society's well-being. Um, but, but they are also subject to um, limitations in terms of what realistically can be uh, changed. If we look at the various outcomes that are actually um, shifted by these um, activities from positive psychology, almost all of them relate to either happiness, making you more happy or satisfied with life, uh, or, or, or health, um, uh, mental health, especially alleviating um, you know, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, uh, somewhat at least, um, helping with uh, sleep as, as well. Um, uh, and and these, are, these are valuable contributions. Again, I think these sorts of activities should be used. Um, but if we look at some of the other flourishing domains, we, we, we see that there really isn't evidence that these simple, easy do-it-yourself interventions have much effect. If we look at things like purpose or character, or social relationships, it's less clear that these activities deeply affect these other uh, domains of flourishing. Uh, many of the uh, interventions designed to try to increase purpose have, have in fact failed in, um, in randomized trials. And uh, so I, I think these, these other things are, are more difficult to change. Um, there, there might be uh, you know, other practices that, that can contribute to this. Uh, right now we're evaluating in a randomized trial in five different countries, a forgiveness workbook interventions, which distill um, 30 years of, of um, research in clinical psychology on this topic of forgiveness into a two to three hour do-it-yourself, um, easy to use uh, workbook form uh, developed by uh, Everett Worthington based on his model of forgiveness to try to help people to forgive who want to forgive but are, are having difficulty doing so. So we're, we're going to evaluate uh, whether the, these practices of forgiveness might alter some of these other uh, flourishing domains. Uh, but I do think things like purpose and character and social relationships are, are, are more difficult to, to change with a simple one-off um, exercise. I think for these other flourishing domains, we probably do need to turn back to um, the communities that were uh, a part of um, much deeper institutional uh, commitments and, and relationships, things like family and marriage, education, work, religious community, uh, these institutional pathways for flourishing, I think are important in shaping um, these other domains of flourishing. So I think you know, the positive psychology interventions have, have been helpful and, and uh, I think we should continue to, to investigate them and to develop new ones and to improve them. Um, but we need to be aware of um, their limitations as well um, in return to the communal and institutional commitments that uh, promote flourishing. Uh, and the final case study I'd like to uh, discuss with regard um, to these flourishing domains and how they might be used um, as an interpretative framework uh, concerns narratives of societal progress um, and I'd, I'd like to, to focus for a few minutes on um, Steven Pinker's book uh, en Enlightenment uh, Now which attracted a great deal of, of attention. He's is a psychologist at, at Harvard, one of my uh, colleagues. The book received a lot of media attention, it was on the New York Times bestseller list, uh, Bill Gates' 
declared it my new favorite book of all time. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of discussion of it, a lot of uh, critique as well. Um, a lot of the critique has focused on, on parts one and three uh, of, of the book, um, the more historical and, and philosophical parts on sort of Pinker's interpretation of the Enlightenment and his discussion of the importance of reason and science and, and humanism. Um, and uh, I think a lot of that's important and interesting uh, discussion. I won't be going into that here, um, but the majority of his book, part two, um, is r really devoted to an empirical analysis and kind of chart after chart, figure after figure, suggesting that uh, despite popular belief, uh, almost all aspects of life, according to Pinker, have, have seemingly gotten better and better over time. Uh, he documents, I think correctly, uh, that we have a higher life expectancy, that we're healthier, wealthier, safer, better human rights, less famine and undernourishment, uh, knowledge and education have have, have improved. Um, and, and so his, his claim uh, is that as a society, um, the world has improved uh, uh, remarkably. And, um, you know, while I think what he presents is important and um, worthwhile and, and even um, correct. I think m many of us have a notion, but it, it just doesn't seem that everything has, has gotten better. Um, so we might ask, you know, what's missing from this analysis? And here also, I think that, um, that lens of the, the flourishing domains as an interpretive framework can be helpful. Um, if we look at Pinker's list of in improvements in the world, which are, are important and it's an impressive list, um, but, but we see that they essentially all concern either health or happiness or economics. And what's just as important is what has been left out of the analysis. And I think that is for the most part, um, relationships, meaning, and questions of character. And, and here, you know, I think the, the data are, um, are less clear that we really have been improving. And I think you know, real indication that, that uh, we should be concerned about losses in these areas uh, with regard to social relationships, uh, community participation rates have fallen dramatically in the West. Uh, trust, levels of trust have likewise fallen. Uh, marriage rates are considerably lower, despite that being a desired outcome for the vast majority. Uh, loneliness for adults, in contrast to the students presented in, in Pinker's book, uh, loneliness for adults uh, seems to be, be going up. The data is imperfect, um, but uh, the best data we have does seem to indicate that loneliness is increasing. So with regard to social relationships, it's not clear we are making progress. Um, likewise, with meaning and purpose, it's very difficult to get um, good data. We're hoping to change that with the Global Flourishing Study, but um, um, you know, at, at present we have just crude indicators here and there. Uh, but with respect to meaning and purpose, uh, unlike measures of happiness, measures of meaning and purpose are in fact higher in poorer developing countries uh, than they are in, in richer developed countries. Um, so we might wonder whether um, there have in fact been losses here as well over time. With regard to character, again, the fact that levels of trust have fallen is probably not a, a good indication that uh, um, uh, character has been improving. There, there likely have been losses here as well. Um, if you ask people whether they think others are living as honest and moral lives as they used to, uh, the, the levels reporting yes have been, have been going down. Again, a sort of indirect indication uh, that uh, we, we're not making good progress on improving the virtue and character. Of individuals and as a society. Um, Pinker does note that uh, on you know, many accounts uh, levels of, of violence and, and crime are, are lower. Um, no, but even this is um, complicated by uh, the interpretation of what, what constitutes uh, violence. A practice such as um, abortion is considered by, by some an important right and, and by others as, as, as a death, as a murder. Um, and if you, if you were to include um, abortion amongst violent deaths, then you know, the last half century would be one of the most violent of, of all of history. There's not going to be agreement and consensus on these points, but it certainly does uh, complicate the picture. Um, so while I do think the improvements to health and happiness and, and economics are, are real, um, you know, perhaps uh, halted uh, in part by, by COVID-19 and the present uh, pandemic, but I, you know, I think the trends Pinker points out in this regard are important and substantial. Um, I think there may have been losses in social relationships and meaning uh, 
um, in character. And so we might wonder whether we are trading off more material outcomes for these other flourishing outcomes that are related more closely to what it means uh, to, to be human. Um, I think this framework could also be helpful in understanding issues related to uh, physician-assisted suicide, trying to understand well-being in the workplace to move from kind of wellness programs focused on physical health to well-being programs. Um, I think the framework could be helpful in understanding responses to COVID-19. Much of the discussion has been trade-offs between health and the economy, uh, but there are also challenges with um, social relationships, with psychological well-being. And these flourishing domains are interconnected. There's evidence that um, loneliness and that lack of employment uh, leads to higher mortality rates. So we do need to trade off um, you know, these various flourishing domains and be careful with regard to uh, how, how we're doing so. Um, the current crisis might, might in fact in certain domains lead to uh, you know, elevated levels of, of, of character, of helping others, uh, might help us to find meaning within the context of, of, of suffering. So I, you know, I think this flourishing framework and these flourishing domains uh, can be helpful in understanding these various um, aspects of well-being across different settings. Uh, this framework does have its limitations. Um, as I noted earlier, uh, you know, I think one of those is any uh, well-developed conception of flourishing is going to be uh, much richer than these than these five or or six uh, domains. Notably, you know, absent from from uh, this framework is any sort of notion of spiritual well-being, which of course is at the heart of many uh, religious uh, traditions. Um, you know, th there I don't think uh, kind of global universal questions are going to be sufficient. I think tradition-specific measures of spiritual well-being will be needed, um, and we've been doing some preliminary work on development of, of such measures uh, as, as well, but that's still in very early stages. But I, I think it is important to acknowledge what is absent um, from uh, this uh, flourishing framework as I've presented, and I do think spiritual well-being is a, is a critical piece, and a lot of this work should be supplemented by tradition-specific measures of spiritual well-being. Um, likewise, I think notions of community well-being are um, important and, and, and central. The framework I've been presenting has focused mostly on individual um, level well-being, uh, but I think uh, you know, to, to promote flourishing across the globe, we need well-functioning governments and, and, and societies. Uh, we need um, effective leadership systems. We need good financial systems. We need absence of corruption and we need levels of trust and civic stability. Um, and, and so um, community well-being needs to be a focus uh, as well. Um, and community, community well-being can contribute to individual well-being. And we've again been doing some preliminary experimental work with various measures of community well-being also to, to supplement the various flourishing measures. Um, um, and while community well-being, I think, does contribute to individual well-being, I think the effects are in, in both directions, where um, individual flourishing, you know, perhaps especially with regard to, to, to meaning, to purpose, and to, to character, to virtue, likewise, contributes to a fuller societal flourishing. Um, so when using this framework, I think it often helps broaden the lens beyond kind of economic and health outcomes, but uh, even with that broader lens, it's important to acknowledge what um, is, is absent, and uh, we're hoping in subsequent work uh, to supplement it with um, some of these additional spiritual well-being and community well-being measures. Uh, so in conclusion, I really do think a broader range of flourishing outcomes should be assessed in, in, in research or by governments and the schools and, and workplaces uh, and personal reflection. I think this flourishing framework helps to come to a more holistic understanding of well-being. I think it also helps us understand the, the pathways uh, that support these various aspects of uh, flourishing and in their holistic sense, uh, like family, work, education, religious community, and to help put in place policies to support these pathways to flourishing. I think to bring this about, we do need an allocation, reallocation of, of, of resources, both financial and, and sort of human resources to promote this work, to promote uh, research. I mean, the fact that we know so little empirically about the determinants of meaning and purpose as compared to cardiovascular diseases is extraordinary given that meaning and purpose really is something sought uh, by, by everyone. Um, so I'm all for the study of cardiovascular disease, but I think similar rigorous study ought to be devoted to meaning and purpose. Uh, as well, but that will require a shifting of, of governmental and of research resources to these other flourishing outcomes. Um, I will acknowledge, as I did earlier, that um, 
Now, these things are difficult to measure. There are, are limitations of these measures, but I do think something, even imperfect, is better uh, than nothing at all. I think what we measure shapes what we discuss, what we know, what we aim for, and the policies put in place to achieve it. And so I think we need to broaden our lens to look at flourishing more holistically. I think focusing on these questions will contribute uh, both to greater individual flourishing, but also uh, to greater flourishing as a society as well. Thank you.